time to do a Bible study. I don't have so much of a lesson as I have a Bible study. And I want to focus in on three of these wealthy places, the temples, and the title of our lesson is The Tale of Three Temples. The Tale of Three Temples. Let's go to the first temple, First Chronicles chapter 17, since you're already there. First Chronicles 17, verse 1, we're going to look at the first temple, Solomon's temple. First Chronicles 17, verse 1. Let's go, my brother. After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in the house of cedar, while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for it comes with you. But that night the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. You are not the one to build me a house to dwell in. I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israel up out of Egypt to this day. I have moved from one tent side to another, from one dwelling to another. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their leaders whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house of cedars? Skip on now to the end of verse 10. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him, as I took it away from your predecessor. I will send him over my house, and my kingdom forever. My throne will be established forever. You know, right here we find that David settled into his house. And so at this point, although David was very victorious in battle, he, he conquered all of the surrounding nations. And he got to a place of peace in his life where he could just settle in at home. And he had this incredible palace, this beautiful palatial structure. And he goes, you know, it just doesn't feel right that I'm living like this. And I'm looking out and I see the Ark of Covenant in a tent. And let's be honest, over the years, that tent probably had a lot of wear and tear on it. Yeah. As it was taken down and put back up and taken down and put back up and sacrifices were made and blood spattered, you know, like all kinds of things. I mean, we can't even keep church banners uh, up uh, uh, within like a year before they fall apart. I mean, it's you can imagine, it was a lot right there. And so David goes, you know what, I just got to build something for God. Yeah. I want to build a temple for God. And he goes, here I am living in the house of cedar, while the ark of covenant is under a tent. Now, what tent was David referring to? The tabernacle. So he wanted to replace the tabernacle with the concept of a temple. Now Nathan goes, hey, whatever you have in mind, I think it's awesome. You should go for it. That's, that's a great idea. God goes, whoa, 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 hold on a second, David. Hold your horses. I appreciate David's heart, and I think it's awesome that he wants to build a house. But, you know, have I ever said... I really want one of my leaders to build me a house. Yeah. And so right here we find that God actually didn't really care wow. that he was in a tabernacle. Wow. He didn't really care that it was a little beat up or it was a little bit messed up or that it had to be taken down and set back up and that it was temporary and it was mobile and all these different things. He didn't really care if it was a palatial structure. Why? Because I think right here we find a principle of the scripture. God understood that if we built a beautiful temple is people, if we dressed it in gold and it was incredible and it become this, this incredible wonder of the world, then we would actually focus more on the temple, more on the organization, yeah. more on the structure than on God himself. On, and it's not about the organization. It's not about the structure. On, it's not about the temple. It's always been about God. On, well, God allows David to build this temple. But he doesn't want David to be the one to build it. He wants Solomon to build the temple. Well, you know, why would, why would God not want David to build the temple? I mean, David was, after all, the man after God's own heart. Well, the Bible actually gives us a reason. You don't have to turn there. But in 1 Chronicles 22, 8, it said that David had shed too much blood. Yeah. And so God goes, you know what? You're, you're awesome, but you're really more of a warrior. And I want my house, the temple, to be built by a man of peace. Well, Solomon, the, the name Solomon, comes from the Hebrew word for shalom, which literally means peace. And that's exactly how Solomon ruled. His rule was a rule of peace. And God goes, okay, I want Solomon, the man of peace, to build this up. Why? Because all of this was foreshadowing what? It was foreshadowing the Christian church of the first century. It was foreshadowing the New Testament church. And who is the builder of the New Testament church? 
It's Jesus. And Jesus, when he came to build his church, did he come for war or did he come for peace? You know, it's amazing. Even in Jerusalem, when he entered Jerusalem for the first time in Matthew 21 5, it says that he entered riding it on a donkey. Why? Because the donkey symbolized peace. Later on, though, in Revelation 19, it says that he's going to be riding back, but riding on a white horse, which is symbolic of what? War. War. And so when Jesus came, he came for peace to make peace with mankind. And as we submit to his terms, as we submit to his standard, then we can be at peace with Jesus. And therefore, we're not at war with Jesus. But make no mistake about it. If we don't submit to Jesus' terms, he is coming back for war. And we don't want to be at war with him. You know, I think this brings us to, I think, another misconception. You know, oftentimes we, we talk about Jesus being the, the God of peace or being one who brings peace to earth. And that's true. Jesus can bring peace to earth. But sometimes we think that that means that the world itself is going to be at peace. The very first thing that happened when Jesus was born is that Herod started killing all the babies. But he did not come to make the earth peaceful. He came to bring peace, meaning that he was a source of peace in a chaotic, messed up world. And so even in the midst of chaos, we can look to Jesus. And in fact, that's why the chaos even exists, because God is drawing us back to Jesus. And therefore, we can gain peace through Jesus. It's not a, a physical outward peace. It's an inward peace. It's a peace for our soul. And I think, guys, right now, even with all the chaos going on in the world, the reason why there is so much chaos is because God wants us to go back to Jesus and to find peace in Jesus because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Come on, brother. Well, Solomon is given the charge to build up this, this incredible temple. And David sets it all up and gives him all the resources. And then Solomon, well, as soon as he takes over ruling God's kingdom, he starts to build that temple. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1. Here he, he's finally completed the temple. And it says, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Let's we'll skip by that verse 12. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of, of Israel and spread out his hands. Now he had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. So he had a nice little platform he was preaching at. And it says, he, he placed it in the center of the other court. He stood on the platform and then knelt down before the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. He said, Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise for your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, promise you made him to him when you said, You shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law, as you have done. And now, Lord of God, let your word as you promised your servant David come true. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, can't contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. You know, right here, as Solomon finishes this first temple, Again, this is a glorious structure, beautiful temple, baptized in gold, very expensive. I mean, it was amazing. I actually went online yesterday, and I was looking at models that people did to try to duplicate what Solomon built. And it's shocking even how big the temple was. I mean, it was enormous. And if you walked into Jerusalem, it would have been the first thing that caught your attention. It was that amazing, that awesome. And after Solomon gets done building it, he goes, wow, I built this magnificent temple for the Lord. God is going to live on earth forever. But then a little later, you see that there's like kind of a second guessing almost yeah. in Solomon yeah. where he goes, well, will God really dwell here on earth? Will he really dwell in this temple, this man-made temple that I have built? Even the heavens can't contain God. How much less can something that I've built contain God? Yeah. 
You know, I think that sometimes it can be challenging for us to separate the concept of a man-made structure, a man-made organization from a spiritual kingdom, yeah. a spiritual entity. And in some ways for good reason, because we get baptized into the kingdom of God, do we not? Yeah. Yeah. We, we say Jesus is Lord. Yeah. We don't get baptized just into the Toronto church. We get yeah. baptized into the kingdom of God. Yeah. But because we also get baptized into the Toronto church, there, there's a, a man-made organization that we associate with the kingdom. And so sometimes when that starts to get tr messed up or, or we start to, to feel like that's not working out or we, we sometimes just rebrand it or a different name, all of a sudden we get freaked out. Oh no, is this not the kingdom of God anymore? No, no, it's always been the kingdom of God. That's right, bro. As long as a disciple is following the word of God, yeah. and as long as a disciple has said, Jesus is Lord, whenever a disciple has made Jesus king, that is God's kingdom on earth. And it doesn't matter if they're in the Toronto International Christian Church or if they're in the Restored Church Toronto. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they're in the ICC or any other worldly organization. It is the kingdom of God that we are all about. You know, I personally was baptized in 20, 2001. I was baptized into the International Churches of Christ. Yes. That movement fell apart. And then we started over in 2006. Yeah. Very interestingly, in that time period, many of the people that were with us in restarting the, quote, movement are the same people that are now criticizing us for leaving and starting a new movement. I was there from 2006 to 2024, just this weekend. <laughs> and now I am in my now third movement. <laughs> and it is going to move because God is going to move. <laughs> This concept out. Straight up, straight up. that we're not just a part of a worldly organization. Yes. We are a part of the kingdom of God. Yes. And the kingdom of God is beyond the, the walls of a worldly organization. Yes. It is beyond the man-made walls of a temple. Who can contain God? Even the heavens can contain God. On, Nothing that man can build will ever contain God. On, well, later, this temple that was built by Solomon was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. But what caused that to happen? We'll go to 2 Kings chapter 20. Come on, bro. 2 Kings chapter 20. Wow. Beach brother. Beach brother. Beach brother. Beach brother. Beach brother. Beach brother. Beach Let's go, bro. Verse 12. You know, we understand that there was sin that started to permeate throughout Judah at this time. Sadly, northern Israel was already taken over by the Assyrians. Because of their sin, God gave them over to the Assyrian Empire. And in Jeremiah 3, you actually find that God was hoping that this would be a warning shot to the, 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 the southern tribes, the two tribes of Judah. Yep. But sadly, Judah did not repent after they saw what happened to northern Israel. But who was leading Judah when they almost got taken out by the Assyrian Empire, just like northern Israel had? It was Hezekiah. And so right here in Hezekiah's life, we're going to see really the first drifting, the first drifting of God's people and the leadership of God's people on, that leads ultimately to the Babylonian exile. Second Kings chapter 20, verse 12. Let's go, Come on, it says, at that time, Marduk Peladon, son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his armory, and even things found among his treasures. There was nothing in all of his palace or in all of his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. And I just said, because hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all of your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. So, so what happens in Hezekiah's life? Well, first, he gets struck with an illness. He has a deadly boil. And God gives him, actually, amazingly, 15 more years of life after he prays to the Lord. Pretty incredible. 
Sadly, he probably would have been better off if he had died when God first struck him with illness. He, did, he starts to drift and becomes prideful. And in his pride, he invites these foreign envoys from Babylon into his kingdom. And the Bible says that he shows them all of the treasures in all of Israel. Now, we know that those in Babylon would not, be able, uh, would not have been allowed into the temple because the Gentiles were not permitted to enter into the temple. But don't, don't make mistakes about it, that, that absolutely they would have seen the temple and they would have seen that it was dressed in gold and they would have assumed that it was probably full of equally valuable things. You with me on that? Yeah. And so this kind of becomes the first drift. And why? Because Hezekiah failed to protect the treasures of his kingdom. And I think likewise, God's people start to drift when we fail to protect the treasure of God's kingdom, his standard, and the righteous call of his people. And as soon as we stop protecting that standard, the treasure of the gospel, you can believe that exile is sure. Yeah. Well, we know that Nebuchadnezzar comes in in 606 BC, and that becomes the first wave of exile into Babylon. Again, he comes through a second wave of uh, attacking Israel in 597, and then he takes more exiles into Babylon. And finally, he comes with this third wave of destruction over Israel and totally destroys the walls of Jerusalem, totally destroys Jerusalem, and even destroys the temple in 586 B.C. But in Jeremiah 29, you turn with me there. Told you we do a Bible study here. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Jeremiah gives these words through God. God gives it through him, actually. To the people, Jeremiah 20 never said, it says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, place, Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from the nations and places I have banished you, place, Lord, and will bring you back from the place that carried you into exile. And so what is the promise of God? He goes, say, you're going to go into exile, but in 70 years, you're going to get radical again, and you're going to give your whole heart back to God. And when you worship me wholeheartedly, and seek after me wholeheartedly. He goes, then I will bring you back out of exile. And my promises to you is that you're going to have a hope in the future for the rest of your life. Amen. 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 Well, that brings us to Ezra chapter 1. Let's go, bro. Ezra chapter 1. On, let's go. So we know that the exile starts in 606 BC. 70 years later, that, that takes us to what year? 536 BC. Well, guess what happens in 536 B.C.? God allows Ezra to become king of Babylon. At this time, the Persian Empire has taken over Babylon, and Ezra becomes the king of Persia. What's the first thing that Ezra does as king? Well, look at this verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to build the word of the Lord spoken by him, can I? There it is. The, the, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kings of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and Levites, everyone who's what? Whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord. And, and you see this great revival happening. Where people come out of Babylon. And it wasn't all of the people that came out of Babylon. Only those whose hearts were fully committed to the Lord. Only those who were wholeheartedly seeking God. They go, man, we just want to do something awesome for God. Let us go back and build a temple for the Lord. Well, this group is led by Zerubbabel. And so this becomes known as Zerubbabel's temple. Well, let's go to Ezra 4. 
Come on, brother. In chapter 3, verse 10, they lay the foundation of the temple. In chapter 4, verse 4, they start to receive opposition to the building. And you can bet anytime you start trying to build something for God, you're going to be opposed. Yep. It's a fact. And so sadly, what we find right here in Ezra, uh, Ezra chapter 4, verse 24. Thus the work of the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so the opposition becomes so overwhelming to the people that they lose faith, lose heart, and the building in Jerusalem stops. Believe it or not, the temple stays in this situation where just the foundation was built for 20 years and nobody lifted a finger to build the temple. Well, chapter 5 and verse 1, this actually takes place about 20 years later, in about 516 B.C. It says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Ido, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who is over them. So how does God fix with the, the temple from stopping, from, from Come on, being stuck and not being built? He sends in the prophets. And so the two prophets that God points are Haggai and Zechariah. That's what right here. Yeah. Yeah. Haggai was the older prophet, and we know this because in the book of Haggai, he mentions the former temple. And so Haggai had to have been at least 75, 80 years old. And so he's an older guy, and so his chapter's kind of short, you know, because the older guy's just like, hey, just say what you want to say. <laughs> and then you got Zechariah, who's a young guy, he's been just a little longer, right? 14 chapters of Zechariah. They call him a minor prophet, but there was nothing minor about Zechariah. They start preaching, and then that kicks off another wave of building until they finish the temple again in 516 BC. Let's well, let's, let's go and see what they preach. Look at Haggai chapter 2. Oh, let's go, bro. Haggai chapter 2. Make your Bible very clear, bro. Thank you. Let's go. Come on, brother. Preach it. Come on. Remember, everything that happens in the Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities that we encounter as New, New Testament Christians. Yes. And so Haggai, in chapter 2, you know, usually we, we focus in on chapter 1. Today we're really in chapter 2. Come on, brother. They go back to the building, and this is where God speaks to people. It says right here in verse 6. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake the nations, and what is desired by all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of this former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Come on, brother. You know, I, I, I've read the scriptures many times. Uh, I, I, I taught this scripture. And I think that, sadly, I, I learned something about the scripture the last week that I've never seen before. And I realized that we've actually been teaching the scripture wrong the entire time. Oh, no. Yeah. You know, it's always been taught that this scripture was referencing the second temple. That the second temple was more glorious because although it wasn't built with the same resources of Solomon, the gold, the silver, all these different things, it was built by the hearts of those who came out of exile. And so a, from a spiritual perspective, there's a greater glory in that second temple than the first temple. I've actually come to believe that that's not what this is saying. How, how do we know that? Well, let's look at it one more time. It says right there, verse 6, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake what? Oh. All nations. And it was desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory. So, when did all nations go into Zerubbabel's temple? It never happened. So this is not actually referencing Zerubbabel's temple. So what would this be referencing, talking about this incredible gathering of all nations in Jerusalem? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, who's trying to get it? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. You see, it's very important because we, we've taught that the ICOC, the movement that the ICC came out of, was the first temple. And 
it was glorious. And God worked and it grew that to 135,000 disciples worldwide. That was incredible. But that was like the first temple and it had all the resources and all that stuff. And then we've taught that the ICC is like the second temple and it's far more glorious than the first temple because although it's not as big and it doesn't have many resources, it's built with the hearts of those who are building. So I think about it, I don't think that the hearts were any different from those that built the first temple in the ICOC. And I don't think that our hearts are any different from those that started to build the ICC in the early days of the ICC. You remember that? Yeah. So the glory, the glory was never about these man-made temples. No. Look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Yeah. 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 The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I'm burning with jealousy for her. Remember, this is Zechariah, the younger prophet. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city, the mountain of the Lord the Almighty, will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, and each of them with a cane in hand because of their age. Amen. <laughs> the city streets will fill with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty? You guys think this is so special. This temple, I know that you guys put so much stock into this man-made structure, but is it really that incredible to me? I spoke the world into being. I created you. I created the gold. I own the gold and the silver. Do you think that I'm impressed by a man-made organization or temple? Chapter 8, verse 18. Come on, bro. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fast of the four, the fifth, and seventh, and tenth month will become joyful and glad celebrations or occasions and happy festivals of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many will come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go to the, to, at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat Him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages, that's all nations, and, and all nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let's go with you because we've heard that God is with you. What is this talking about? Not Zerubbabel's temple. When did all nations go and go, hey, you show me the temple. I want to be a part of it. They couldn't be a part of that temple. When did all nations gather in Jerusalem? It wasn't until Acts 2 yeah. when the kingdom of God yeah. was established. Yeah. Well, let's go to God to you. Okay, so this is Rubel's temple. And again, this is the temple that existed in Jesus' time. So let's go to John 2, verse 13. Remember, at this point, Herod has reconstructed the temple and renovated it. So he put a nice coat of whitewash on the outside. It wasn't that awesome, but he made it look really awesome from the outside. And yet we know that it was filled with corruption on the inside. The religious establishment, the religious establishment itself was corrupt. And those that were there in the temple were likewise corrupted. In John chapter 2, in verse 13, we find these words. When it was almost time for Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple courts. Those sheep and doves, he scattered the coins and money changers and overturned the temple tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Seal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Wow. You know, right, we find that Jesus goes to confront those in the temple that had corrupted this temple. And at the time, what was happening is that people would come from other places to worship in the temple. And in, in order to rip them off, they would exchange their money, but at an unfair price. Or they would bring an animal to sacrifice. And they would look at the, the animal and go, well, you know, this is not like a temple certified animal. 
we need you to buy a temple certified animal, but it was like three times the cost. And so they were robbing people of money and, and things, and they were about material possessions. Why? Because that's what they were worshiping at the end of the day anyway, is the materialism of the temple itself. And Jesus comes in, and the Bible says that he just makes a whip, comes in, and he starts overturning tables, and, and he just causes all kinds of havoc. And the disciples see this, and they go, man, I remember that scripture where it says, zeal for your house will consume me. He goes, that's what's happening right here with Jesus. You know, I was reading this, and it occurred to me three different things. Three different observations. Number one, Jesus did not tell those in the temple that he was coming back with a whip to whip them. Wow. You notice that? Jesus did not tell them, hey, watch out. In a couple minutes, I'm going to come back and I'm going to whip. I'm going to whip you guys. So if you're still here, I'm going to whip you. I just want to give you a warning so you know what's coming. Because I, I want to make sure that I'm totally open and totally, totally honest and not secretive about anything I'm doing. The Bible says Jesus actually left and constructed a whip out of court. So it took some time. And yet, throughout that time, he operated in this covertly. Okay. Then he came back, and the Bible says he whipped those <laughs> out of the temple. You can say he whipped them into shape. Okay. <laughs> Number two, I, I just have to notice that Jesus actually called out the sin of these leaders publicly. Wow. Wow. He didn't try to go and deal with it in private. He goes, hey, you're ripping off the people. This has become a den of robbers. And so he stood up to the rebellious establishment. He was filled with zeal. And he lays it out. Come on, brother. He didn't go, hey, let's go talk in private. Come on. Away from the people. Come on, brother. Now, with our recent letter, we absolutely had all of those conversations. Oh, yeah. In private, but there was a time to bring it to the public. Yeah. And to speak the truth. So. Thirdly, Come on Jesus did not see the temple as the religious establishment's property. He doesn't go, hey, this is your temple. I just want to make sure I'm respectful. You know, I, I want to make sure because you guys are the ones running this thing. I don't want to infringe on you guys. I don't want to step on any toes. He goes, no, this is my father's house. My father's house. And you have made this a den of rocks. Interestingly, what was their response? Hey, by what authority do you have this? Well, who's, who put you in charge, Jesus? You're not a world sector leader. Wow. You're not the movement leader. You don't have the authority to challenge us in this way. He goes, look, I, I got all the authority I need. <laughs> right there. Right, here. right there. Wow. He then says, destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. But what temple was he talking about? He was looking at Zerubbabel's temple. But he was talking about himself. Yes. That takes us to a third temple. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Verse 57. Matthew 26, verse 57. At this time, Jesus has been arrested. And now he's appearing before the Sanhedrin. These were the best and brightest in all of Jerusalem. 70. 70 men. That's who made up the Sanhedrin. They were the religious establishment of his time. And here they are, they're questioning Jesus. And the Bible says right here in verse 57, this, those who arrested Jesus took the time to stop priests but the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. And I hope that we don't have anybody that's willing to follow me at a distance or follow Jesus at a distance, but that we are heart and soul united on the word of God. Yeah, he entered and sat down in the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole said, were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Can you believe he said that? How arrogant that he thought he could actually build something awesome for God. Wow. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that he's going to bring against you? But Jesus remained silent. Woo. You know, this is incredible. Jesus is brought up with the Sanhedrin, once again, the religious establishment of his time. 
And we know and we understand, and the author, I think, right here, Matthew, makes a, a, a pointed effort to help us to, to see that Jesus was completely innocent. Jesus was sinless. Amen to that? Yeah. And so as we're going through, the Bible says that they were looking for false evidence against Jesus. So not just evidence, but false evidence. What does that imply? That they understood that he was innocent, but they were trying to make it look like he was guilty. Yeah. And so they were looking to like make up evidence or create evidence. Now, amazingly, even in that, they still could not convict Jesus. Then they brought false witnesses forward, and people were actually coming forward to lie to convict Jesus. And still, even though people were lying, they could not convict Jesus because Jesus was innocent and righteous. But the Bible is saying in verse 60 that finally two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. So this actually becomes the main charge against Jesus and the one charge. That ultimately gets Jesus crucified. What was the charge? That he would rebuild the temple and te- oh, he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. What temple was he talking about? He was talking about his body. In fact, we can know this for sure because we can go to Mark's account in Mark 14. You can turn with me there. Mark 14, in verse, verse 58. In Mark's account right here, it literally says, in verse 58, it says, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Is that cranky right there? So what is he talking about? He's talking about his body, that he was going to go to the cross, he was going to destroy the temple, and then it was going to resurrect in three days. He was going to build it back up in three days. Now, ultimately, when a disciple gets baptized, what are they doing? They are participating in Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And when they come up out of the water of baptism, what do they become a part of? They become a part of God's spiritual kingdom on earth. And so this is a participation that we go through on our way into God's kingdom, and then collectively, we make up Jesus' body, Jesus' church. You know that? You know, I think that this is ultimately what the greater glory was all about. It was all about the church of God. It was never about man-made structures. God's not impressed by all that. He spoke it all into being. It was about this right here. Because this is what God wants, the human heart. And yet we have a tendency to get all focused on all the wrong stuff, look at organizations and structures, and it takes our eyes off of what's really important, what really matters. It's all about God. That is the greater glory. God's kingdom, God's church, God's people, God's standard, God's word, God's ministry. And that all equates to God's glory. You know that? You know, today it's exciting. We already saw Red One did that to us. On Thursday, on Thursday, we got to see Beverly get baptized in the Peel region. After our service here at the end, we're going to get to see Enoch and Solomon get baptized. And it's really great to see him because he wants to get baptized too tonight as well. God is really moved. You know, our church started the year in 95. And through all of the additions that we should see today, the church will then go to 136 this year. That is great. An increase of 41 disciples. I mean, God is moving. God is moving in his church because God's kingdom, God's church, holds to God's standards. And what does that create? What did John 15? <laughs> John 15, verse 8. We're in it, guys. We're in the Bible. John 15, verse 8. It says, This is to my Father's glory, that you eke out a couple of fruits. That you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. You know, sadly, one of the things that we've been accused of is, is worshiping fruit. Yes. Yes, we worship God. We produce fruit for the glory of God. But make no mistake about it. That those that are not producing lunch fruit 
are not about the glory of God. Don't tell me that you're about God's glory. It's all about God. Move God, move the ministry. It's all about God. Don't tell me that when you're not about much fruit. Because when you've got a group of soul out disciples, they're all about God's glory. They're not about man-made structures. They're not about roles or positions or authority. They're not about the religious establishment. They're about producing fruit for the Lord and for God's glory. And so we close out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 10. I know this is a heavy topic. And so I want to leave you with this scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. Bible says, by the grace God has given us. And hasn't God given us a lot of grace? Yeah. I mean, it's really amazing just being God's team. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't have to be here. We get to be here. This is awesome. I mean, who would have thought that our life would look like this? As a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who would have thought that we'd be getting up here and preaching in front of the church? At a different call. That we would have ended up here. God's grace is with us. He says, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build the character. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, air, straw, their work will be shown for what it is. The day will bring the light, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what's been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Amen. Amen. If this burns up, uh oh, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. Amen. Even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Amen. You know, guys, we're not building. A man-made organization. Yeah, right. We're not about building with wood, hair, straw, or, or even with gold or silver. Those don't even pale in comparison to building on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We want to make sure that we are building on this. We are building on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2. And I believe that if we build on Jesus, the principles of Jesus, the Bible, Jesus' teachings, the word, the standard of Jesus, then we're going to see the results of Jesus' ministry. When we've got Jesus' ministry in Toronto, we're going to see the fruit of Jesus' ministry. But it's got to be all about Jesus. And I think right now, we're going to go through a test. Yeah, yeah. We are going to be tested with fire. And it's going to test us individually, and it's going to test us collectively. Yeah. And we've got to go, man, we've got to get back to Jesus. And make sure that we personally are on that foundation, a sure foundation, building on the rock. For if we are building on the rock, then no storm, nor tornado, no earthquake, nothing can take us out. Because our foundation is sure on the rock of Jesus Christ. You know, when I look at what God has done here, and I look at the group that we have here in Toronto, I don't see, I don't see the, the restored church to rock. I don't see the Toronto International Christian Church. Straight up, that's right. I see a group of disciples. Straight yeah. up. I see the kingdom of God. Yeah. I see God's special temple. A people chosen by God. A special possession. And I see a room that is full of people that collectively are not a group built by human hands, but are changed by the very finger of God. And because God is with us, then I believe that we're going to see a greater glory in the Toronto church than has ever been seen in the Toronto church ever before. Come on.